Uh, welcome everyone to another online edition of the Zurich Friends of Haskell Meetup. I hope you're all doing well. I'm very excited to welcome Samir as our speaker today. Samir will be speaking about writing an integration testing framework in Haskell. Uh, welcome, Samir. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I must confess, this is my first Haskell C meetup because I have been really lazy about attending meetups in Zurich before all the crisis happened. I moved here about nine months ago, I think. Uh, and it's, I only just feel like now, like I've managed to settle in and it's been very weird settling into a new country uh, with all of the drama that's been going on in the world, but I'm doing my best. So yeah, I work for a digital asset. I work on DAML. Uh, I will happily tell you about DAML later. Basically it's, think of it as enterprise Haskell, but without all the negative connotations that comes with and you won't be far off. And uh, on that note, I will proceed. So nine years ago, I had a problem, a good problem. Uh, I worked at a company in London and we were hiring. Uh, we had a decent reputation. And so we got quite a few applicants for the job. Uh, so quite a few people applied and then quite a few turned into too many. And suddenly we had to figure out how to not interview everyone. Our interview process was fairly involved. We didn't want to spend a day with each candidate when we knew half of them probably wouldn't work out. So we started uh, asking candidates to do a quick programming challenge, uh, half an hour, any language you like, any patterns you like, any style you like, and the only thing you had to do was solve a basic problem. I can't actually remember what the problem was because it was several years ago, but I think it was something along the lines of diff two dates or diff two times or something like that. Uh, the only constraint was you had to write the code in half an hour. Uh, so that solved the too many people problem. We used it to filter out quite uh, enough people that we could comfortably manage the rest. Uh, but now we had a new problem. Uh, how do you evaluate lots of random interview set of submissions written in any programming language? So we cared about two things. Uh, firstly, did the candidate solve the problem? Uh, we didn't need it to catch every edge case, but we expected uh, the solution to at least get the basics right, uh, figure out uh, where the corner cases might be. Generally, put some, we wanted them to have put some thought into uh, what possible inputs they could have had. Uh, the second thing we cared about was, does it read well? Could we understand the code by reading it? Would we like to work with that code in the future? How likely is it that introducing a new feature would also introduce a brand new bug? Uh, now the second one, uh, I actually started a startup trying to tackle that problem. I'm sure it's the subject of a dozen PhD theses right now. Uh, probably using way too many GPUs and not getting very far. Uh, I know we didn't, uh, but the first one, does it work? That can be automated, right? I mean, I know how to write a te unit test. You probably know how to write a unit test. You know, we can automate that. And so I decided to automate everything. Uh, so the first version of what I'm about to talk about, Smoke, kind of looks something like this. Now I've made it up here because I can't actually remember and I do not have the code, but it was not that far off this code. It was, I mean, some of you will recognize this as RSpec. Some of you won't recognize it as RSpec, but we'll go, that's very similar to HSpec or that's very similar to Scala test. Uh, RSpec is kind of where it started uh, 12, 15 years ago, whenever it was. Uh, this actually worked. Uh, well, I mean, it worked for Ruby code, right? Because how do you test it when someone isn't writing Ruby code. And so, and that wasn't helpful because we were hiring Java developers. Most of them submitted Java or Scala uh, or actually a couple of closure submissions, not too many Ruby ones. Ruby just made it really easy for me to write the test, but it wasn't actually helpful. Uh, so after experimenting with JRuby for a while and not getting very far, I got an idea. Um, I decided to use the universal interface, uh, not the other universal interface, I wasn't worried about calling uh, C with FFI, uh, but Linux. Uh, I can run programs from other programs. We have inputs, we have standard input and command line arguments, and we have standard output. Uh, so if I could just tell my Ruby script how to run the program, 
it would run it and it would return the standard output and then I could test that. Easy, right? Uh, and this kind of worked, right? It gave us enough. We could write two lines of code, wrap their code in a main function, and then we could run a load of tests against it. What this meant was we didn't have to think about, did I check it for this particular edge case? Am I being fair to all candidates by checking their code in the exact same way? Because we were, we knew we were. Uh, and so I had a test framework that worked on every programming language. Uh, this was pretty useful. And so I did with any, what I do with anything which is pretty useful, which is I went completely overboard. I was really excited by this idea of not caring about a programming language. Uh, it seemed fitting that a test framework that doesn't care about your programming language should ha not use a specific programming language to define the, the test cases. And bear in mind, I had one use case for this, right? This was entirely me having fun. But what I ended up doing was writing something like this. So we'd have an input file one day dot in, it has two arguments, which are passed as command line arguments or standard input, can't really remember what we did at first. And then we have an output file, which is the expected output of that program. Uh, and then it would, we just compare them and decide whether it passed or failed, right? Uh, I call this project smoke because the tests felt to me like smoke tests and they weren't really good enough to, you know, actually test a program fully, but they were helpful. Uh, I have a feeling I'm missing a slide. It's gone. It doesn't matter. I want to show you what smoke looks like. Maybe I can just, yes, here we go. So this is what smoke does. Uh, you give it some fixtures or you give it some tests. Uh, in this case, it's working on a calculator fixture, which I use for testing. And it runs a bunch of tests and give, checks shows you the input and the expected output and whether they passed or failed. It's kind of what you'd expect the test framework to do, give or take, uh, with some important caveats that we can go into if anyone is interested. So this was the first implementation of Smoke proper. Uh, I'm not expecting you to read this code, but the interesting parts are up here where we retrieve the name of the test case and the application from the arguments and down here where we glob over all .in files and then construct a test case for each one. I'm a big fan of this technique, dynamically generating test cases. It's nastier in languages like Scala or Haskell, but you could still totally do it. Uh, probably shouldn't advise that. So I had a version that used RSpec to generate tests and then I quickly just removed RSpec and wrote my own pretty printer that you know, printed out the inputs and the outputs and what, if they, if there was a failure and succeeded, if it was a success. Uh, and then it started to grow. In 2017, uh, Smoke was six years old. I was using it off and on for a variety of little things and a couple of people I knew were also using it. I don't, I still have no idea whether this project is popular or not, but it seems to be gaining a little bit of traction now for some reason. Uh, it has had 100 commits or so and 269 lines. This, it's not a big project, right? It's basically a large script. And it was a large Ruby script. Uh, but I had a problem, a new problem. It was becoming very hard to add functionality to Smoke uh, because it had grown way past its original purpose. Uh, and every time I tried to add something, I would break 10 other features. I would break Windows support because for some reason I had Windows support. I don't know why, but people actually use it. So I'm keeping it. Uh, I would find odd edge cases that would take a long time to debug because uh, the code was very intertwined and changing one thing really changed everything. It was time for a change. So, I decided it was time to finally write Haskell in anger. I'd been playing with Haskell off and on for a while. I enjoyed writing Haskell, uh, but I'd only really used it for toys, right? Uh, to do calculations, to understand how to how late evaluation works, 
but I hadn't really used it for a project, a real project. Uh, and this to me was a real project. I used it, I liked it, I wanted to keep it maintained. Haskell seems like an odd choice, right? Uh, Smoke is a program that runs other programs and does string comparisons. Like it's got Perl written all over it, or Ruby, which is basically modern Perl. A purely functional language hardly seems like it's going to make this thing easier to work with. And that's what I thought anyway. And I was wrong. So I'd like to show you a little bit about my history of working with uh, Haskell to build Smoke version 2.0. Uh, I want to show you a couple of positive experiences I had, a couple of negative experiences I had. And my goal here is not to make this, uh, what's the word? It's not to make uh, you feel good or bad about your favorite programming language. Uh, all I want to show you is the challenges I faced so that next time you look at a project, maybe you don't make the same mistakes I did. And maybe uh, you have a better time writing Haskell than I did. And I say that with the caveat that I'm still writing Haskell and still very much enjoying it. So the first one, uh, my $10 mistake. You may be familiar with Tony Hoare's billion dollar mistake. So in 1965, I believe, Tony Hoare invented Algol, which was one of the first modern programming languages. It was, you know, proto C. Uh, and it, he also invented a really important concept that has survived into many, many other languages uh, called null, uh, which he invented because he really didn't have a solution for forcing initialization at declaration. So if you declare a variable and then you initialize it, uh, you need something to put there in the middle for a while. And that was called null. It probably hasn't cost me a billion dollars, but I think it's probably cost me about 10 or at least. So Ruby has a value called nil, uh, which represents nothing. Uh, unlike in a statically typed language, this isn't so much of a problem. I'll show you why. Uh, those of you familiar with Java will know that we don't do this anymore. We used to do this. We don't do this anymore. Uh, if you create an object, uh, you don't then set the reference to null, not because you can't, but because it breaks the type system, right? Null does not respond to messages in the same way way that the object does. You can pretend it's the object, but as soon as you try to use it anyway, you get a crash, uh, even when crashing should not be allowed by the system. Uh, and we get away with this because Java has this concept of runtime exceptions, which means anything can crash at any time, uh, but it's not safe. And I mean, at least I try and avoid it in my Java programming as much as I do in other programming languages. This, however, is somehow totally legitimate. Uh, in Ruby, you can set x to 3, then x to 3 again, but a different type, and then x to nil. And that is fine. And it's fine because Ruby doesn't have a type system. It has runtime tags or types, uh, but it doesn't have any static typing. So x doesn't have a type. The value of x has a type, but x the variable doesn't. And so it's up to you, the reader, to understand what type x has at any given moment. It might change. Uh, whether you can argue later about whether mutation is good or bad, but you know, actually the, the types are fine. The first one has a type integer, the second one has type string, and the third one has type null class. That's okay. So not surprisingly, this leads to surprises. This is real code from the first version of Smoke. Uh, what this does is take the command that Smoke is supposed to run, the command that it is testing from uh, uh, the uh, command line arguments, that's the override. And if it can't find that, then it looks for a file uh, called testname.command, so one day dot command, uh, two plus two dot command, whatever, uh, whatever your test name is. And if it can't find that, it checks whether there's a root command, a single command file for all test cases. And then it checks and it gathers all the lines up and stores them in the command variable. I would like some audience participation now. Did you spot the bug? Audience participation on Zoom sucks because I can't tell if anyone's ever going to say anything, but let's try it. I mean, uh, I don't even know what any of these variables are, so I wouldn't know where to start, Samir. Ah, no, that's so fair. what if none of the cases? Exactly. 
So what do you, when you have no else case in an if in Ruby, well, you get nil. Uh, and that is painful. It took me five years to recognize this bug. Like I found the commit where I fixed it and it was in 2016. Uh, now that could speak to uh, the, you know, the ability of buggy code to still do the job, or it could be a scathing indictment of my programming ability in general. Uh, either way, if you've ever been glad you have maybe at disposal, uh, maybe at your disposal, uh, imagine how I feel. Uh, I have no idea how I ever programmed without maybe or option or optional. Uh, the first incarnation of the Haskell version looked like this. Now it's a little hairy because there's IO and maybe mixed together. So we have a lifted alternative uh, operator, which lets us work within IO, but each line there is a maybe. So command for location is a maybe off command. I think command is a wrapper around the, it's in a list of strings, but let's go with that. Uh, so command from options is a maybe off command uh, and read command file if exists returns an IO of maybe of command. Everything here matches types and it does because there's no alternative. If they didn't, it wouldn't compile, right? I never forgot to check whether command was nothing in the Haskell version because I couldn't. I bring, I bring this up not because it's new. You have all seen this before, right? You switch to Haskell and suddenly everything that was implicit in your previous language becomes explicit. You have to reason about things you don't, you never had to reason about before, before you compile your program, rather than looking at the logs later to figure out whether something broke. But the, the reason I bring it up is this brought me real joy. I never had to think about this again. And that was work, all these funny operators that you see on this code. I wasn't used to them. I didn't really understand what the alternative operator did. I have no idea how I even figured out what lift A2 does. Uh, I have a feeling HLint told me to use it because I probably had uh, uh, splats everywhere. But that to me was worth the trade-off. The code here, okay, maybe it's a little less obvious to the naive reader than the, the equivalent Ruby version, but I can look at it and go, that works. I have a proof that it works and that was valuable to me. The second thing I learned wasn't so positive. Uh, the basic type definitions in Smoke went through a fairly tumultuous process. So here's kind of what they looked like. Uh, the new types came pretty quickly. Uh, I had type aliases for status and standard in and standard out, which quickly became wrappers because you only have to you only have to get standard out and standard error mixed up once before you realize that was a bad idea. Uh, so the new types were helpful. Uh, this worked, right? I just had to, when I wanted to check whether a test succeeded or failed, I just compare the expected status against the actual status, the expected standard out against the actual standard out, the expected standard error against the actual standard error and construct the relevant uh, test result. This worked really well until I had a program that generated 20,000 lines of output uh, because string in Haskell is really a list of characters. And when you're reading large files, what you really don't want is a very large list of characters. So this was frustrating, right? Fortunately, I'm not the first person to notice this. So I did some digging and converted the strings to byte string. And that was a fun learning curve. Uh, the challenge wasn't really changing that code, but changing all the code that dealt with it. Uh, suddenly I had to learn an entirely new API, which looked nothing like the string API in our school, despite being roughly solving the same purpose. Uh, but I also had to figure out how they work together, strings and byte strings. And at this point, I mean, I had a vague, vague understanding of what a monoid was, but I didn't know how to use it. Uh, and I definitely didn't know about things like overloaded strings, which might've helped me. Uh, it was frustrating because I was adding a lot of code uh, for what I thought should, was I thought was something that should have been solved for me already. So at this point, I had a headache. But the real problem was that byte strings 
weren't appropriate either. You see, they made working with Windows really painful. Uh, I mentioned this might work on Windows, right? I Still, I'm not sure why this is, but it does. Uh, so Windows disagrees with Unix, it's Unices. Please message me on Slack and tell me how what the plural of Unix is. Uh, and so Windows works differently to Unix, uh, Mac OS, Linux, etc. Uh, the new line character is two characters. It's a uh, carriage return followed by a line feed. Whereas on uh, Linux, on Mac OS, it's just a line feed. Uh, which is bad because if I compare two byte streams and one was generated on Windows and one was generated on Linux and they otherwise have the same content, they will be different. Uh, the new lines will be different. If I generate a uh, the output, uh, the expected output on Linux and then test it on Windows, it will fail. And it won't be an obvious failure because the diff will look like nothing is wrong. Uh, this, is, this is a serious problem. I got performance improvement, but I had a bug now. Uh, so, you know, at this point, I was getting angry. Uh, and so I didn't have this problem with string, right? Because string works with characters. Uh, and I think uh, when you're reading a file, it kind of figures this stuff out for you. Whereas with byte strings, you ask for bytes, you get bytes. So I switched again. I switched from byte string to text from the text package. So cue another refactoring that was way too big and touched every single part of the code base. Uh, I had a similar issue for different reasons when I changed the specification format. So at some point I recognized that having lots of in and out files was getting very unwieldy and I couldn't really just read a test case anymore because it was scattered across multiple files. It was very hard to look at the tests and understand the logic of how things worked. So I went with the flow. I introduced YAML because that's what we did in 2017. Uh, I was working with Kubernetes at the time and I guess Stockholm syndrome is real. Uh, and when I introduced YAML, I also introduced the ASON package because that's, that was, that's what the YAML package uses to pass it, uh, which means I discovered that uh, string, JSON strings were text. Okay, cool, I was already using text. And JSON arrays were vectors. This makes sense, right? Because uh, for the same reason that a very, very long list of characters is painful, a very, very long list of something else uh, is also painful. Uh, if I want to index it, I have a problem. If I want to you know, transform it, I end up with laziness, which sometimes is valuable, but sometimes just has irritating performance concerns you couldn't have predicted, or at least I couldn't have predicted. So I'm led to believe Vector is way more efficient. Unfortunately, now I had two ways of representing a list of things, one of which I didn't understand. So queue a confusing code base where there was no real reason why I'd choose one or the other, apart from whatever made sense at the time because either this was close to the YAML parsing or far away from it. And there were a lot of conversions back and forth. I eventually switched entirely to Vector, removing a list, but I was kind of disappointed. I was upset. I was not happy about the current situation because the standard library has let me down again. I felt like I was in the Java world once more where I have a 20 different list types and none of them are the right choice. They all just have different trade-offs that I don't understand. Uh, at least with Java, I have a chance of them sharing a common interface, right? And I really worry that Backpack is gonna make this even harder. Uh, I appreciate the experienced Haskell developer can default to a fast text implementation and they know how, but how is a newbie like me going to make these kind of decisions? They're not right. They're going to go with the defaults and the defaults are painful. Like list of A might be beautiful in its simplicity. That like the definition of map is gorgeous. The definition of fold is brilliant, uh, but it's dangerous. I spent months, I had worked with Haskell for years, I had toy projects and, I understood how lists worked. And then suddenly, I had, not only did I have to throw it away, I was told I was wrong all along and I should have been using something else. Uh, I worry that already many people have decided not to use Haskell, not because they don't like it, but because they were six months in when they realized that reasoning about performance is about as easy as understanding monads in terms of a 
popular tech snacks dish. So let's talk about burritos. Um, I am told that the explanation of Monad's burritos is a joke. I really hope that's true. Uh, the look on people's faces when you, if people, you act serious about it is not great. Uh, you know, the look on people's faces when you explain that uh, monads are simply a monoid in the category of endofunctors. I mean, it's enjoyable the first time, but the second time it just makes you sad. Uh, by the way, I, I once spent six hours with multiple people at an unconference. In fact, I think it was this unconference. Uh, trying to understand that why a, monoid, a monad was a monoid in the category of endofunctors. And I think, yeah, we took, we, we had an hour long session to figure out six hours later, we were still there with the flip charts, trying to figure it out, getting bitten by mosquitoes because we were outside. And eventually we got it. And then I went to sleep because it was late. And then I woke up the next morning and I had no idea what the proof was anymore. Uh, I don't remember anything and I remain unconvinced, but that's beside the point. Uh, so when you tell me exceptions are monads, okay, cool. I think I understand monads. Uh, I know how they work. Is it just like IO? I can use IO and you go, yeah, exceptions are kind of like IO. They work in the same way. And that's kind of true, except for one caveat. Uh, I still need IO. So now I have to use the two together. So if I'm in the accepts monad, I can't do IO. And if I'm in the IO mad, I IO monad, I can throw exceptions, but they're unsafe. And the whole point of switching to Haskell was to be safe. So, you know, unchecked exceptions are the root of all evil. Java got one thing right. So I started learning. I started reading about effect systems, but this was three years ago and they weren't really there yet, except for a few papers that went mostly over my head. Uh, I started reading more. And then I learned about monad transformers and I thought, okay, that looks like a good solution to my problem. It looks like everyone uses these things. That's great. Uh, I think the moment I tried to use MTL was the stupidest I've ever felt in my entire career as a programmer. And I have put production data, like unique ir irrevocable da uh, data in MongoDB. And still MTL was the stupidest I ever felt. So very briefly, a mono transformer, if you don't know, looks something like this. This function makes use of a transformer. And what this does is it takes IO and it and the exception monad and smushes them together somehow. And my first take was, okay, maybe it's something like this. Okay, it's I, IO and then there's exceptions inside it. And this is kind of true, except you can't work with both at once in the latter. Uh, I, I, you're in IO and then you have to do pure operations where you deal with exceptions and somehow propagate them out. And when you want to interleave these things get painful. So I guess it's actually nothing like that. What except T does is nothing short of magic, as in it is it's indistinguishable from sufficiently advanced science. Each bind operation or each line of a do block runs through both monadic binds. It allows you to weave between them. It allows you to treat it as one. Uh, and the only thing you have to do is wrap any IO expression in lift IO. So scatter a few calls to lift IO in your code base and you are good to go. Uh, if you're wrapping other monad transformers, I believe you can even omit the lifting uh, and just call the relevant functions and the types will be worked out for you in a frantic mess of compiler backtracking that I never ever want to think about. So this was great, right? I mean, it solves the problem, but it turns out I couldn't get my head around it. Uh, I had just started to understand that I needed to be thinking at the type level, that reasoning about types was how I understood that my program was gonna do the right thing. I could read it and go, this, these types align or they don't. And then what MTL asked me to do was go back to not understanding the types, to just let the compiler do its job and it will figure it out. Uh, it was another level of Haskell development that I'm still not comfortable with. I still don't quite trust it to do its job. I'm just about comfortable with it. I don't even know how to construct an XFT or get in or out of it. I don't really understand it. I just kind of throw the, some functions at it until it works. Uh, I feel like I've lost something. With a simple piece of code, I can read it and know that it's going to work because I understand the types. When I transformers feel like programming Ruby again.
No, that's a lie. Monet Transformers feel like programming Ruby again, but at least I have a compiler. At least it still crashes at compile time. And I do appreciate that. So it turns out I still don't understand monads. And I'm okay with never actually understanding monads. One day I'm going to watch those category theory lectures on YouTube from Bart Hoshmolesky, but until then, I don't understand them. And I'm okay with that because what I realized was it's okay to love IO. So Smoke started off as a glorified shell script. Well, it was written in Ruby, but you know, it wasn't far off a shell script. It was a Ruby script. It had some test cases, but that's about it. And like any script, its main job was to do something, make something else do something. It wasn't its job to do work. It was its job to ask for work to be done and then consume the result. Uh, so when it came time to port to Haskell, I took that mindset with me, which meant everything was IO. This is a pipeline, right? So first I pass the operations, then I discover the tests. Uh, sorry, pass the options, not the operations. I can't read my own code. Uh, so first I pass up uh, the options. This is, you know, command line arguments, that sort of thing. Uh, then I discover the tests. I look for the in and out files. Then I run the test, and then I print the summary, and then I exit. Like all those operations are IO. So we've got a chain of things, and that kind of just made sense to me. Everything is IO because this is an IO based program and I'm just gonna go with it. Uh, now it looks kind of more like this. This is simplified and these types don't all exist in the same place, but that's basically the type of the program. The, if I had started with this, I would never have finished. Like, we're told as Haskell developers that purity is sacred. Like, IO should be confined to as small a surface area as possible. And I think this is wonderful advice. And like all good advice, sometimes you can just toss it right out of the window. There's a time for perfection and there's a time for just smashing things together, hacking. Uh, if you can do IO, you can do anything. So there are no bounds. And the start of a project, even when you roughly know where you're going, is a time for the latter. It's a time for just hacking things together. Because the core of Smoke at this point boils down to this code. It's not very complicated. All it does is run a program uh, with some arguments and some standard inputs, and then consume the exit code, the standard out, and the standard error. And then basically compare those to the expected values and return success or failure accordingly. I mean, there's a lot more to it, but it was all, you know, the above discovery, uh, printing, handling weird error cases that let's not get into. Uh, if you're like me and a purist at heart, you will strive for abstraction and reuse whenever you can. Uh, I recommend holding off on that when you start and for as long as you can, because it's a great way to make sure you never finish. I think it's okay to work with IO string everywhere at the start. Not because it's the right choice, but because it's the right choice for now. And you don't have to worry about programming for later. You have to worry about programming for now. Uh, it's like, as Sandy Metz says, uh, duplication is far cheaper than the wrong abstraction. So I'm really glad that I've had the opportunity with Smoke to learn about how to pass YAML with ASUN in a type safe way, uh, how to rely, reliably build it with Nix, how to handle exceptions with Exceptee, uh, property-based testing with Hedgehog, and uh, I'm not glad about having to work with Windows, but you know, it happened. Uh, I'm also really glad I learned about most of these after I shipped version two, because if I had tried beforehand, this Haskell experiment would still be in the lab. The last thing I learned was that types and scripting can go together. So Smoke, it's no longer a script or even a collection of scripts. It is a real program. But even when it wasn't a real program, having a type system really helped. I had a strategy when writing Ruby code. Uh, you make a small change, you run the tests, and you see what breaks. This kind of worked. Uh, if I got the output wrong or I got the logic wrong, uh, I would it would say, hey, your program printed X, but it should have printed Y. Uh, this was kind of useful. Sometimes it would just print nothing because I had a nil somewhere, and if you print nil, it prints nothing. Uh, but you know that at least told me some information. 
it meant I had to have a lot of test cases. And sometimes I didn't have the right test case. It took me a long time before I had tests for multi-byte Unicode characters, such as Chinese. Uh, it had, had a while before I had tests that printed anti-escape codes in weird ways to see how Smoke dealt with them. Uh, this is learning from experience, right? It's normal. But I sometimes I did consider these things. I did consider what would happen if I uh, handled anti-escape codes wrongly, but I would forget to handle them all the way through the code. So I'd raise an exception, but forget to catch it. And it, the program would bomb, right? And sure, that gives you something, but still it's painful to know that I could ship a piece of software having thought about an edge case and it would still fail because of that edge case because I missed the right place to handle it or missed all of the different right places to handle it. So now when I make an improvement, I follow a very, very, very simple process, an even simpler process than the previous one. I make a tiny change, compile and see what is affected. Those of you who've written Mode Haskell will be very familiar with this process, right? Uh, I have my new types, which helps me because I can see, okay, this, I expected X, but got Y. Uh, early on, I realized I had a bug with smoke because it would always print with color, you know, uh, red for failure, green for success. This was annoying when you work with a terminal that doesn't support color, which included a lot of CI environments and still does. So when I run my tests in CI, I don't expect color output unless the CI environment can support color output. So what I wanted was to turn that off, right? In the Ruby version, that would have mean detecting whether you're in the right terminal, uh, fairly easy, and then propagating that information to the right place. Well, I probably could have done it the second or third time around. In Haskell, I needed to determine whether the terminal was uh, allowing color or not. And that was not that easy because I had to do different things based on whether it was Linux or Windows, but it wasn't that hard either. And then I just added the check to the right place and away I went. What happened was, well, I needed to add a parameter with your function to get that information and that parameter necessitated a parameter in the calling function and so on and so on. And the compiler just kept telling me, hey, add this or it won't compile. And I did and it worked first try. I it was an entirely mechanical process. And sometimes I really appreciate that I did the hard work of understanding the problem and making the solution. Now, fitting it into everything else, come on, you can do that compiler. I will check that you did the right thing, but you can do it for me. And that's basically what the Haskell compiler does. It does half the work for me. Uh, I've recently been bitten uh, by this. Uh, I chose ZSH for better or for worse as a scripting language for a very small task at work. Uh, that small task was not so small as I thought. And now there are a thousand or so lines of shell scripts. And maybe ZSH was the right choice for the first week, uh, but I regret not rewriting it in a statically typed language such as Haskell, uh, because I've had so many issues which basically boil down to one script calls another script in the wrong way. It doesn't provide the right parameters. Uh, and I really pity the fool, and that fool is probably me is gonna to have to maintain it in six months when no one really knows how it works. And I have a feeling if I'm maintaining it in six months, it's gonna get rewritten. So, I have no doubt that Haskell was the right choice for version two of Smoke. But, just like uh, Ruby was the right choice for version one. You know, Ruby allowed me to write a very small fr test framework in three hours, maybe less, in 40 lines of code. Uh, Haskell allowed me to build it into a fully featured maintainable piece of software, which I would love it if you try, by the way. I will provide a link in a moment. Uh, I've tried to touch on a few areas why Haskell suited the needs of this project uh, and some areas where it didn't. But the, re this, the real reason why Haskell was the right language, well, the needs of the project were somewhat irrelevant. Uh, 
Haskell suited my needs, my personal needs. I didn't just need a ro more robust language. You know, I when I was writing this code, I was also writing TypeScript in my day job, which is also a fairly robust programming language. Uh, for, probably not as robust, but you know, much closer to it than Ruby. But I also needed a challenge. I needed to learn something new. I needed to do something different. And I really, really needed to not write any more JavaScript. So I'm sure that some of you work in an environment where Haskell is the right choice for the job, or you have a pet project where Haskell is the right choice for the job. Uh, and you can show it, you have like the metrics. It, it's uh, obviously the right choice because uh, look at this library we can use that solves half our problem. Uh, some of you will be working in an environment where DAML is the right choice for the job. We should talk about that later. Uh, sometimes the right choice is a lot more personal than that. You know, sometimes uh, the right choice uh, is for your team it's like it's about the money it's about the people sometimes it's the free soda that's why you stick together as a team when you ask yourself uh what will keep us working on this project not just for the next five weeks but for the next five years like often it's the people but sometimes it really is the language sometimes it's the tools and i i think the more we are honest with ourselves the more we tell ourselves that you know, our choice of tools is not just important because of what they do for us, but the feelings they give us along the way, I think we'll be able to write much better software. Uh, and that is the end of my 45 minute long spiel about why I like Haskell and why I don't. Uh, you can check out Smoke on GitHub. You can get to the content of this talk in essay form at noodlesandwich.com. You can see here I'm actually presenting from there and there's an essay version as well uh, because I need to write stuff down before I talk about it. Otherwise, I just get lost in the weeds. And you can check out Daml if you're very interested in Haskell for your business uh, at daml.com. But we can talk later about that privately if you're interested. Now. I have no idea if anyone has any questions. I have no idea if this was interesting or if everyone switched off, uh, but I really hope it was useful. And if you have any questions or suggestions, can you uh, just shout? Well, great talk. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot for sharing your experience. Uh, it was a great talk. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, shoot. A lovely philosophical ending. Uh, I always end on a philosophical point because otherwise I just keep talking forever and ever and ever. So I have to, I have to stop with some philosophy. Stephen could attest to me talking forever and ever and ever. I can make a suggestion. Uh, there is a library called Rio. If that was available when you started, <laughs> it was not available then, and it is now. And I'm I'm very tempted to try it, but I also am very tempted to not bother rewriting everything. <laughs> I think I think the the direction is clear. You need to combine your powers of your experience. Version three needs to be a program written in Haskell that outputs the smoke written in Ruby which you then execute. But it outputs different versions of Smoke written in Ruby. I'd rather do the other way around. You know, Ruby is the spring managing language. I'd rather generate Haskell from Ruby. I guess, is it more complicated to include the Ruby distribution in your pro in Smoke or the Haskell distribution in Smoke? Uh, if you use Nix, they're both highly complicated. So, moot. Uh, I will stop sharing Not a real this. program until it depends on Nix. <laughs> uh, I think it does. Hang on. I, well, it doesn't really depend on it, but it does have a uh, default.nix just in case you need it. And Twiga, like, like one person from Twiga sent a pull request. It was to the Nix stuff, not to any of the pro actual program. Oh, two people from Twig. Look at that. Uh, so yeah, um, if you want to check it out on GitHub, if you think it might be useful for you or you just want to play or you want to uh, tackle one of the very few issues in the issue tracker, uh, please feel free. Uh, 
I am definitely looking to for someone else to implement as many features as possible. I would welcome that because I am lazy. So you're uh, one question I have. A, sorry, uh, one question I have about is um, what feature were you trying to implement when you noticed you wanted to switch from Ruby to Haskell? Do you remember? Um, no, I don't remember. I really don't. Uh, I think. I was just frustrated in general. I think I did implement a feature and it was so painful. I'd have to troll through the commit logs again. So I'm not going to do that on video because it will take too long, but uh, I might drop it into Slack if I can remember. Um, the, I think it also came at a time where I was using Haskell for a couple of toy projects. So it was, there was some level of familiarity, at least with Stack. So I knew how to build a Haskell project. Uh, so it felt less intimidating than like if I known that it would be so painful, I probably wouldn't have done it anyway, but I might have been a little bit more anxious about it. Uh, and I say so painful, it wasn't that painful. That was great stuff too. Uh, but the, uh, but I know I honestly can't remember what it was. And anyone else? I have time. I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, thank you, thank you for for the talk. Uh, it's uh, I don't know. It's 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 really great to hear uh, other people's experiences with with Haskell. Uh, and and yeah, I I I, I empathized a lot with <laughs> with your story. I I, I can remember the points in my Haskell career. <laughs> Oh, now I have to understand Monad transformers. What's that? Yeah, uh, and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's it's like a, it's really it's really cool uh, to to see that that other people struggled struggled with the with this too. Uh, and I don't know. I hope I hope you you won't give up and and eventually take the time and uh, and and actually understand what's yeah. inside the Mona transformers. It's not that complicated. It's, oh, uh, people keep telling me this, but I should, <laughs> I, uh, I yeah. plan on it. I it just uh, has never been a massive priority. It was always in. Uh, I need to get this done. I need this to compile because I need. I want to ship this feature because I need it for a different project. Uh, never. Uh, I I'm really interested in Mono transformers, so I'm going to use them. I think I was looking at the code f to prepare for this talk, and I saw a number of ways in which I could improve things. So I'm I'm starting to think I have a better understanding now than I thought I did. So that's all. That's hopeful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I totally agree with the with the pragmatic approach. I I, I want to make this work. I want to mm -hmm. understand I'll, stuff enough. I, to, to I definitely have the approach of the first version will only work by accident mm -hmm. because it the the previous thirty nine versions didn't compile, so the fortieth version compiled, and we call that v one. And then v two, I'll understand how it works. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I guess we are done. Thank you very, very much for listening to me. Thank you for I the really talk. I really appreciate yeah, it. Once more, thanks a lot for the